Welcome, everybody, and um, and uh, good to see you all for today's Product Tank Sydney event. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're from outside of Sydney. I see we have someone from Melbourne. We don't judge. It's all fine. Hi, Maria, by the way. Um, and, um, and yes, my estimates, I did solo and I didn't do planning poker with the stakeholder um, as, uh, as a really bad engineer obviously would. Uh, hence, I'm a product manager now and no longer an engineer. Okay, uh, so we have a fantastic program today. I am really excited about the speakers that we have and also how their how their talks essentially combine. So let's go straight into it. First of all, if you haven't been to a product tank event, um, know that we are essentially the largest product community in the world by product people for product people, um, uh, and um, we have events all over the world. So. If you have a lot of time, then you can probably see a lot of uh, these events streamed online because um, I think a lot of them are still online instead of in person. We're planning to go back to in-person events possibly in April, May. Uh, more announcements on that once we have our next event sorted. Um, product Tank is our community, um, and Mind the Product is the organization that sort of sits as an umbrella uh, uh, over it. And um, Mind the Product uh, is product training. They do one of the largest, uh, I think the largest, uh, product conferences in the world. And um, if you want to upskill as a product manager um, and you know product tank is enough, then uh, check out Mind the Product and, um, and take things to the next level. Uh, now, uh, if you're not from Australia, then uh, acknowledgement of country might not be familiar to you. Um, check the history of Australia and um, how we treated Aboriginals, and um, we're trying to do a whole lot better. So, in the spirit of reconciliation, Product Tank acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. Um, we pay our respects to elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Um, I hope we have a couple of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people with us today. Uh, if so, uh, mention yourself in the or, or, or raise your hand uh, in the chat uh, and let us know because that would be awesome. Um, okay, now. Uh, you're attending an event, but there's lots and lots of ways to uh, get involved in the community. Um, if you think you've got something to share, like I'm up in faith today, uh, get in touch. Uh, send me an email, then at productwise.com. Uh, you can also get in touch with me for any other reason, literally. Um, very passionate about product, always have a chat um, and, and bring this community closer together. Uh, my philosophy is always, well, look, if we can get uh, you know, uh, if we can upskill product people and we can build better products, we create faster growing and better companies and there's going to be more opportunities for everyone. So let's help build this ecosystem. We're all going to benefit from it. Um, you guys write blogs at Mind the Product, um, which is uh, there's a, an incredible selection of blogs already um, and, um, and, and lots of great readings. So um, yeah, if you've got something to share, but you don't really, are, you're not really into public speaking, lots of other ways to get involved and, and add value to the community. Okay, um, I've done the intro about myself so many times and I'm getting bored of it, so I can't imagine what it would be like for you. Uh, look, I'm Benjamin Birds, I'm a scale-up product leader in Sydney. Um, I uh, was lucky enough to work with some world-class organizations in the past like Atlassian and Google. Uh, I had a couple of my own startups um, and I've worked with a few scale-ups to help fix everything from strategy to processes and actually building capabilities and, and growing teams. Um, and so running Product Tank is one of my passions. I um, also used to teach at General Assembly. And so, again, anything we can do to upskill people in this ecosystem is a good thing. If that resonates with you, get in touch. Now, our first speaker um, is Faith Forster. Um, and Faith has taken Vonto through essentially a, a journey of finding product market fit. And she's, uh, she had a, a startup herself, so um, she has lots and lots of best practices to share. And the exciting thing about Faith's talk is actually how it brings a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the best practices that we sort of know in product, it brings them together. And it, it shows how, you know, if they all come together, how it can make a real difference for a company. Um, and so our second talk um, is from Amak Sada, um, who's a co-founder at ESOL, uh, so currently building a startup, and who used to work at Intercom and Atlassian, so help grow those companies. And so Amak's talk is looking at a lot of the what we think of classic best practice and product and call out the lies or the things that don't always work, the common wisdom that doesn't really always apply. Um, so, so you sort of get the two sides of the coin and, and hopefully a very, very nuanced um, perspective on um, on the product things. Um, and so 
yeah, really looking forward to it. Uh, now I, uh, yep, those are my slides. Um, so now we go into the first talk by Faith. Hi, Faith. Um, and, um, and over to you to uh, tell everyone about the uh, story of Vonto. Have fun. Thanks, Ben. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here tonight, Ben. Um, this is a story of great passion and love, I guess, over six months or so um, until late last year. Um, so I'm going to give, I'm going to sort of rush through these slides a little bit. So just so I can touch on all the different elements of what we did, um, we'll have some Q&A at the end. So if there's anything in particular you want me to pick up on and talk in more detail, then we can do that towards the end. Um, so there's, there's a lot in here to go through. So um, apologies in advance for it being quite quick. Um, so what is Vonto, first of all? Um, so Vonto is an analytics tool for small business owners. Um, so the purpose of it is to connect all the different SaaS products that small business owners tend to use and provide insights into how their business is performing all in one place. So the idea is to kind of provide a holistic view of business performance. Um, so I was actually a customer of Vonto before I joined the team with my last startup, um, it was a bit left field for me, not a tech business. It was a, a food business. Um, and so I knew as a customer, I knew the product wasn't quite right. And I was giving feedback to the team about that and um, and then joined to help them sort of narrow in on who their customer segment was and, and um, get the product to the point where it could scale. Um, we are, the reason for the slides, we are part of, so we are a corporate venture. Uh, we, we're part of the X15 portfolio, which is the corporate venturing arm from the Commonwealth Bank. Um, so you, hence the, the branding. Um, so when I joined, in terms of the challenge, um, Fonta was a very much a leaky bucket. Um, so because we were part of X15 and had the luxury of a partnership with CBA to help with our go-to-market, we'd had a lot of signups. So there's about 25,000 signups of um, small businesses, organisations. Um, but we only had about 72 weekly active users or 255 monthly active users. So, um, yeah, serious, seriously leaky bucket. Um, there's a lot of work we needed to do to get it to, to perform in the way we wanted it to. What we saw as the opportunity was that this space, the analytics tools for small business owners, is a poorly defined space. Um, when you speak to business owners, they recognise the pain, but there hasn't been any any solution yet that's really cracked it. And so... It's not something that they necessarily think to look for because there isn't an obvious answer to it. Um, there is a potential for it to be an annuity product. Like it's, you know, commercially speaking, um, you know, customers are will definitely willing to pay to, to solve this problem. Um, and it's an ongoing sort of subscription-based model. Um, if we can get it to the point where it's actually part of their daily or weekly habit, um, there's huge potential commercially with that. Um, but one of the biggest challenges we had is it is it's a very broad potential market. Um, so if you think about small businesses, you know, we're talking about anything from uh, we had in our last round of user testing, we had um, exotic dancing photographers and um, pest controllers and plumbers and, you know, garden landscapers. And like there's just such a range um, when you talk about small business owners that it's very hard to understand their needs and design something that suits the needs because it they are so varied when you look at across different industries. Um, so this is how I plan. <laughs> um, even though I've spent my fair share of time in the corporate world, I, I generally don't like wasting time where I can avoid it on slides. Um, and so this was kind of this was literally what I used to communicate to the, the team the approach we were going to go through to um, to help us find product market fit. So the most important ones are the, the ones in blue. Um, so first of all, we needed to look at what our strategic pillars are and who our target market was. Uh, there was a lot of work we needed to do on our metrics. Uh, we weren't understanding anywhere near well enough the, the user behaviour um, and what that meant for the product. Uh, we then looked, we also needed to spend some time looking at our value proposition for that target market and then work out what, did that mean, what does that mean for our product? Where do we need to take our product to to deliver against a value proposition that's going to resonate with our audience? Um, and therefore, you know, change our roadmap as you would expect. So the very first big question we had to ask was who are we targeting? Um, the other way to frame that is who's going to get the most value from Vonto? Who, who, gets the, who would disproportionately benefit most from Vonto? And just focus on them 
and get the product right for them so that, to the point where they love it and then we can look to expand from there um, and drive scale in that way. Um, so I'm going to skip over a lot of this, but this we went back through all the different data points that we could find. Uh, we did a workshop. I had a cardboard cutout with a couple of people that um, I think this is around the time um, Prince Philip died, so we called them Liz and Phil. Um, where we landed was it's definitely small business owners, and that's important um, when I get to the next slide. Um, but the ones that were getting the disproportionately more value out of the existing product were businesses that were six to 24 months old. So they had paying customers, um, two to 20 employees. So we purposely excluded sole traders. They had to be reasonably digital and tech savvy. So they needed at least three apps that we could connect with. Um, there are some, some of the user testing we've just done. Um, you know, it's sometimes, you know, being in the tech world, it's sometimes hard to imagine, but there's so many businesses now that don't even use accounting packages, um, small businesses that have been around for a very long time. Um, we also, because the tools that we connect into are things like Facebook and Instagram and uh, MailChimp and Google Analytics, they needed to be um, tools that had medium to high volume transactions so that we could kind of gather um, that customer data for them. When you're looking at sort of, like big enterprise sales type um, organisations, we're not going to have the right information for them. Um, so we purposely chose to focus on, we didn't ex we didn't say B2C versus B2B because we didn't think that was quite right. Uh, we focused instead on vol volume of transactions. But then the last question was, you know, the one that we couldn't avoid but we left it to the last, um, was this question of kind of which verticals. Um, and the reason for that is when we looked at the previous data, the, the data from the previous um, slide around who was getting the most value out of it, it was a bit skewed towards certain certain verticals, partly because of um, CBA's customer base, um, but also it was the way that we were capturing the data we didn't feel was reliable. So I actually went through myself. Um, I got the, the list of the top 100 users and went and looked up every single one of their websites to see what, what they'd said they were and what they actually were. And there was just such a stark difference um, in some cases that we didn't we really didn't feel like that data was reliable. Um, and so what we did instead was looked at the previous characteristics that I've, I've got there and then worked, worked backwards and said, well, which of these, which of the different verticals are more likely to have these characteristics um, and prioritised it that way. We also... Um, took another step back and thought about our strategic options. So we were, um, you know, our focus was primarily on um, the one on the left, the generalist tool for small business owners. We were also getting some traction with advisors, particularly bookkeepers. Um, and there was also some conversations going on, um, not just with banks, but actually some other organisations about doing more of a sort of enterprise platform play. Um, and so we, we were kind of trying to do bit too much and in doing so we weren't doing any of it particularly well um, so we also kind of forced a conversation to say you know let's just focus on one and which one of these is it going to be um, and we ended, we decided to focus on small business owners because we felt if we got it right for them first then that that then opened up more opportunities with advisors and um, and as an app uh, an enterprise platform play um, but where we really wanted to sort of shift what we'd been currently doing was to, to take much more of a vertical by vertical approach. So we, we pick one vertical, we, we understand their needs, we design a solution that works for them, get it right um, to the point where they love it, and then move on, do a quick follow through to the next vertical and sort of achieve scale in that way. Um, so the decision on which vertical to focus on was not easy. Um, there was a few things that we did to support that decision. Um, so first of all, we did throughout this whole process, we did five rounds of user testing. I'll, I'll show you what those five rounds are um, shortly. But one of those rounds was we purposely um, brought, got people from four different industry verticals, which were sort of the shortlisted ones, to see you know, of some concepts that we had, which ones resonated the most. We also did some desktop research. Um, and I sort of made a whole bunch of phone calls to our sort of top 100 users, our most retained um, users to understand what it was they were getting the most value out of. And the way we actually made a decision was using a template that I highly recommend. Um, I've used it a few times, including in my startups, um, is this one here. It's called the Ideal Customer Profile. So the link there is in the top of the slide. Um, and it's, it just gives you a framework to go through and to step through and make these decisions. And so we, we took our top verticals and scored them against criteria that we had pre, you know, agreed prior to this session. 
and then ranked them accordingly. And so we came out with tech startups as our first vertical, followed closely by e-commerce. So the next big question is how do they get value? So how do we best meet their needs within this tool? So we started out, um, this is largely from my own experience as a customer, um, but also from some things that we'd learned through customer support and other channels. These were what I considered our value pillars. Um, so they were the top five things that if we got these right, with the exception of potentially the, the fifth one, because that we ended up eliminating that based on the previous discussion. Um, if we got these right, then we felt like we had something that was really valuable for our customers. Um, so we used that to then do a few things. So we did some ideation within our own team um, and sort of prioritise those on must-haves, delight factors or things that we thought could drive performance. Um, we also, again, did some user research. So we, from that ideation, we, we picked out some things. Um, create, I did a, um, like a bit of a design sprint. I actually got two design teams working on this in parallel. So our design team that had been working with us for, you know, at least a couple of years, for quite some time. And then I got two other designers who were completely new to Vonto but actually ran their own small businesses on the side. Um, and so I got both groups independently to create some concepts within a day and a half. And then we took those into user testing. Um, and coincidentally, so you can see the two screens that are there are, are from those two design groups. So the first one is much more social. Like it looks and feels more like a social tool. Um, whereas the second one was much more structured, much more like a business product, what you'd expect from a business product. Um, so we took both of those into user testing. And as it turned out, the structured one got, got the highest um, sort of value indicators. Um, and then we also looked at that sort of outside in view. So um, from those sort of shortlisted uh, verticals, uh, sorry, we're focusing now on tech startups. I actually got someone external to do some research for us to understand kind of what their drivers and goals were, what, what would trigger them to purchase a tool like this? What are some of the existing um, pain points with other incumbent products? And what might be some of their barriers or objections to using a tool like this? So in the, I mentioned that we did three, sorry, five rounds of user testing. So these are the five rounds. Um, the first round was that sort of concept testing. I said where we had the two teams do um, create two concepts in parallel. The second round, we then took that more structured version and refined it based on the feedback that we received. Um, and this was where we were then looking across four different sectors, um, wanted to understand which of those sectors would get the most value from it. Um, as it turned out, it was just it was also infinitely easier to get to recruit tech startup founders to do testing for us, which was also an indicator of um, one of the reasons why we chose chose that sector is we. We felt we had more empathy with tech startup founders, but also that they would be more empathetic with our where we were in our process and more more willing to help and provide feedback and support us um, through Alpha Beta and into full launch. Um, we end up we came up with this concept of um, from those first two rounds of feedback, the idea being um, sort of answers where we landed with it was answers to the questions that matter. So any early stage tech startup founder has to work through their business model. And so there's some really important questions that they need to be able to answer through that validation phase of, you know, who is my target customer? Um, you know, when do we raise capital? Is my pricing too high or too low? Like they're all the sort of big questions that founders tend to worry about when they're, you know, trying to sleep at night. Um, and so that's where we kind of reframed the product to, to sort of pull out those questions and then from the different tools that we connected into find the data to help support or provide evidence so that a founder was able to make those, um, answer those questions or make those decisions and how to progress their business and refine their business model. Um, so we tested the concept, it tested very well. We then, the next round of, from round four, we got confidence around what we th what the full feature set should be um, based on the feedback from round three. And then in round five, we were testing kind of what was the absolute minimum they needed. So what, what did we want to do as a scope for the alpha version of the product and then beta and then through to full launch. We also did some quant research. Um, so user testing, you know, hugely valuable. You get a whole bunch of feedback, but it's a small, small sample size. Um, and so it's, it's a big investment to go ahead and basically rebuild the product. And so we wanted more confidence around that. And so we ran a survey um, to three different cohorts. So we used um, sort of connections and got the survey out through the tech startup community. Uh, we also sent it out to our existing users and then we also sent it out through a market research platform to small business owners in general. 
And so out of that, we had about 400 respondents and got hugely valuable feedback on all sorts of things. We got them to prioritise those questions. We used that data to create our personas. Um, we looked at, you know, integrations. We used um, the questions to understand the, the pricing elasticity, what they'd be willing to price, um, pay for a tool like this, um, and also looked at sort of what the differences were across those three cohorts, um, which has been, like, in hindsight now, has been hugely valuable. Um, we also did a whole bunch of online experimentation, so we, to, particularly around the value proposition. Um, so we started out with five different themes of the way that we could position the product, um, the questions that matter being only one of those themes. Um, so we did a few experiments using Facebook Dynamic um, Creative, if you're aware of that. It's, um, it's a really great way of for quite low cost, basically testing anything that is customer facing, like brands, taglines, um, creative, um, positioning, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's kind of what this is talking about, um, is how we, all the different ways that we ran that experiment. Um, these are the themes that we tested. Sorry, four themes, not five. I said five before. So the, the ones in the right were all the different taglines that we, we tested against um, in the Facebook Dynamic Creative experiment that we ran. And this is where we landed. Um, so this was a, our landing page that we then put up um, and use that to sort of as a basis of the survey respondents that we wanted to get. So from all of that, we then looked at what does this mean for our actual product? Um, so through that process of discovery, um, through the different rounds of user testing, these were the three sort of problem statements that we tested with our audience. Um, once we'd made that decision to focus on tech startup founders, um, we asked them if all of these are true and which ones resonate the most. And we found that all of these are true. Um, different ones will resonate at different times depending on where they are in the life cycle. Um, but what we felt, we felt that if we got the first one right first, then that gave us permission to then try and address the second and the third problem statement. Um, so that was where, yeah, that questions, answers to the questions that matter, that was really focused on helping founders understand and refine their business model. Um, so this is uh, the normal value statement that you, you're probably very familiar with this format, but um, others I've presented this to weren't. <laughs> um, and then we came up with a product vision. Um, so really unpicking every single word, um, being very careful about the choices that we're making in that, so that that helped us make decisions all the way through the processes we um, you know, refined from a concept down to something that was ready to build. Uh, we also put together some design principles, again, to make some of those um, you know, trade-off decisions, and then also put the antithesis. So what was the opposite of the design principle we were trying to achieve? Uh, we then scoped out the different stages of work and being really clear on sort of audience features, the different platforms that we were playing with um, and supporting channels. And I'll, I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, yeah, so we also spend a little bit of time thinking around our, how we enhance our customer life cycle. So while all this was going on, I talked about having a leaky bucket at the start. We were also doing a bunch of work and experimentation in parallel to try and uplift those numbers. Um, so within, you know, two or three months, we doubled our monthly active users, um, which we needed to do to then get the investment to be able to rebuild the product. So that was a really important thing to do. Um, but we knew that the core product experience that there were some fundamentals that just weren't quite quite right about the core product experience we didn't want to invest time on trying to fix those when we we're planning to rebuild anyway um, so the way that we addressed um, we sort of made that the uplift in the in our metrics was really around everything else that goes around the product so things like onboarding you know um, our edms our push notifications like trying to find ways to kind of remind people and bring them back into the product at all times um, and so, you know, with the luxury of being able to rebuild the product, um, it is a huge investment and, and quite a luxury. We wanted to make sure we were making some really conscious choices um, to make sure that we were driving a great customer experience all the way along. One of those, as an example, we wanted to make sure that um, people wanted to come to the product at least weekly. And so there was a few points along this journey where we were making design choices. So the definition of an inactive user went from someone who hadn't been here for 90 days to someone who hadn't been here for seven days, for example. 
We also looked at how we could accelerate our delivery. Um, as I said, we were sort of doing this other work in the background. Um, so yes, we were redesigning our products, but we also did a whole bunch of experimentation, um, as I kind of just alluded to. Um, and then we'd also, you know, there were some things about our product. Even though we, we'd only been in market since February 2020, the, the tech itself was actually six years old. It had been purchased from another bank. Um, and so we were just dealing with a whole bunch of legacy that was really slowing us down. Um, for example, like the, the website was a custom website. And so I, we needed, you know, to, it was literally, it took me three weeks to get four words changed on our website. It was just so frustrating. Um, and so we've now rebuilt the website in WordPress. Uh, we were also made and sort of bit the bullet and decided instead of having a separate iOS and Android platform to move it to React Native, um, and then in doing so, we could kind of share resources between web and mobile a bit better as well. Um, I'm going to skip over a lot of this. This was um, something I presented. It, it might be useful. Um, so we, one of the things that I really brought into the team when I joined was, you know, much more of an experiment-based culture. Um, this was the framework we put together to help drive those experiments. Um, so on the left, you can see, so this is one of the experiments we ran. Um, so we... Our, our website wasn't responsive. So anyone who was signing up on mobile, we had to force them to download the app. And when I joined, there was a few comments made in different different forums that people thought that that was part of the reason why our conversion wasn't, like it was affecting our conversion. And so we kind of ran an experiment. So this is the, the mobile web version that's, you know, then directing people to sort of download the app. Um, you can see that the, the first button is the main button. We added this additional button um, to give them the option to continue with browser. Um, so it's, you know, it's very much secondary. We weren't putting any emphasis on there. We literally just, you know, it took us a day to build. We put it up for two weeks and just wanted to see what happened. Um, and this is sort of what came out of it. So you can see here, this is, this is the second button that we added on. Um, so we had, even though it wasn't, wasn't the primary action that people would naturally go to, we had 25% of our users select that button. Um, which is a pretty significant portion of people to just be losing because you're not giving them the option to continue on a browser. Um, and so that was part of that decision around sort of re-platforming. Re We're going to have to rebuild the web so that it was responsive um, to support, to give people choice around what channels they use and engage with us. Um, we also spent a bit of time looking at um, North Star metrics. So North Star metrics are very difficult to work out without the benefit of some hindsight. Um, I'm sure you guys are well aware of this, but um, North Star metrics should be measuring customer value, but they should also reflect our unique strategy, uh, what makes us different. Um, so the conversion rates are great, but not a North Star metric. Um, they also need to be a leading indicator of revenue um, rather than revenue or engagement itself, which is primarily what we were focusing on. So we came up with a bunch of hypotheses, and that's the things... Um, sorry, in the next slide. Oh, this is Spotify. Spotify example. Um, yeah, these are the, these are the hypotheses we created around what we thought our North Star metrics should be. Um, and so we we've invested uh, much more heavily in analytics. Um, so we've actually embedded our analytics person into um, the, our features work stream. So the the guys building the front end. Um, and so each sprint. You know, he works in the same way the designer does. Um, he, he'll be a sprint ahead of the dev team. But, you know, using the designs to work out what analytics we need, he'll spec it all out and give it to the devs before they even start. So the, the analytics for any work that the, devs, the front end devs are doing becomes part of the definition of done. Uh, and so we, you know, we're going to have a hugely enhanced um, analytics um, Sort of spectrum, I guess, to use to help us make far better decisions, including our North Star metrics. Uh, we also implemented OKRs, which again, you guys are probably quite familiar with. Um, but we had, yeah, you know, we had our highest at our highest level. We had five sort of company wide OKRs, um, and so we spent some time going through and working out de right down to the individual level what each person was contributing to those OKRs. Um, this is a system, the screenshot you can see there is a system called Sugar OKRs, which is free to use. Um, so quite cool. And it gives reminders to people to update their progress against those OKRs um, once a fortnight. So I think that's it. I don't know how I went for time. 
That was awesome. Thank you so much, Faith. Um, if you're online, uh, obviously, we can't build up that excitement and the applause and everything, but um, give, uh, give Faith a hand. Um, I'll leave the slides on for, uh, for a second. So can I do this? In case you want to refer back to everything. Now, everyone online, um, put your questions that you have right into the oh, thanks, Richard, uh, right into the chat, um, and I'll moderate, and we'll go, um, we'll go through them. Um, but first of all, let me say, um, so awesome to see this all come together and, um, and I love seeing really good customer focus. Um, uh, yeah, having not worked at, at Combank, um, felt like uh, it's, it's one of the banks that does have good customer focus. Did you find it difficult though, to sort of, um, get access to customers to interview and, um, and to use a test with and to put things out there? Like those are not, you know, the traditional ways in which a large organization works did you have any challenges or was that already all like just um yeah natural ways of working for them um so so we well we've actually recently been acquired by the bank so we're now technically part of the bank that transition oh, right, yes. but before that we 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 weren't we, we really weren't uh, connected to the bank at all other than our employment contracts um so we we very much worked and operated like a startup um, but mm. we did have the benefit of some support from the X15 portfolio um, for things like, yeah, marketing through CBA, um, yeah. finance support, risk support, that kind of stuff. Um, but outside of that, we very much, yeah, we're a team of um, currently 16 people and we mm. very much ran and operated like a, any other startup. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I think that um, I think X15 has a few roles going at the moment, so that really speaks for the freedom that you get despite being connected to the large um, uh, the large mothership. Uh, that's awesome. Okay. Um, the other question I'd I'd have is if you can share. So Vonto is a free product, um, and the first thing that stands out in the talk is of course you can measure product market fit even if you're not charging for the product, right? Um, because you started with it, the retention curve and whether people change their behavior to using this product as opposed to doing well whatever you know the alternatives are um with a team of 16 people can you share a little bit on how maybe the um um uh, how maybe the um the roi was ultimately determined and and what sort of what success looked like that was sort of defined from the top um given that you know revenue wasn't wasn't measurable but the 16 people team is easily a uh, what do you say, like $3 million investment a year? Yeah, yeah it, is a, it is a decent investment, I see. Um, so the, the direction we got from our board at the time I joined was um, they recognised, so our, our board was, um, yeah, the guy that heads up the X15 portfolio, the, um, I guess, sponsor from Group Strategy. And then we have two external people. So Ben Heap, who's um, a well-known, well-regarded investor from H2 Ventures, and um, Janie, who's a very experienced founder herself. Um, so we've got a really good balance of highly experienced startup people who can um, challenge, I guess, what might otherwise, you know, you know, corporate people don't necessarily understand the startup process mm. particularly well. Um, so they did they did understand it well and they, yeah, you know, the feedback they gave was absolutely spot on. Um, so the direction we got uh, as I joined was they, they acknowledged that we didn't have product market fit. And so they said to focus, just focus on driving up activation, engagement and retention. It's a way mm -hmm. of indicating positive momentum. Um, and that was primarily what they were looking for to be willing to continue to invest in it. Um, and then, but then we also had this sort of greater challenge of finding product market fit. And so we kind of were doing, working on both things in parallel. Um, the board were hugely supportive of that when we showed them, you know, the, the design for the new product, they, they loved it. Um, Janie, having been a startup founder herself, was like, yeah, I totally get this. I can see why it would be valuable for, for founders. Um, so where we were trying to get to with the new design of the product is to make it something that would be commercially viable as well. So we were planning to introduce a subscription model um, as yeah. part of the product launch, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, great. Um, and then, well, I have a bunch more questions, but it would be unfair of me to always just ask mine. So let's uh, take a couple of community questions. Uh, first from David, um, what's the OKR tracking app called that you used? Oh, easy one. It's called Sugar OKRs. Sugar OKRs. Excellent. Um, 
I hope that's helpful. Um, good. Now, um, uh, well, this this one will probably be an easy question as well from uh, Sep. Uh, for the concept testing, which design team had the winning design? Was it internal, external? And um, well, I guess maybe I extend that as opposed to just you know finger pointing who was better or worse. Um, where, where did you find sort of generally the the most most inspiration in in engaging an external team? Um, so I've run design sprints before. Um, quite a bit. When I was at KPMG, I set up the Digital Ventures capability. We, we ran quite a few design sprints. And I always think it's better to take, when you're doing that sort of early stage concept testing, I think it's better to take in two different concepts um, to contrast. I think you get better feedback out of it that way. Um, but again, like I, I was still sort of building up the appetite to, you know, go back to the beginning a bit with our design. So we didn't want to invest too heavily in it. And the comparison... I had, like, I was also trying to show the team that there was a different way of working that was, you know, as a way of driving our velocity because um, prior to us doing that exercise, we are actually using a digital agency at the time. Uh, we've we've bought it in-house since. Um, but, yeah, there, there was one, when I arrived, there was one feature they'd been working on for, like, two months and then it went into user testing and came back as a no. It didn't meet the hypothesis. Um, and so the, the CEO found it really hard to let go of, the feature because it two months had already been invested in it um and so this is i kind of wanted to do this as a way of sort of showing a different way of working and you know demonstrating that you shouldn't be investing too heavily in something until you've got more confidence and validation around it um so that's why i did the, two, the teams in parallel um so we use the you know the, the the designers have been working with us from the agency for some time and then i uh, managed to wrangle some other designers from across x15 to help us out for a couple of days um yeah and it was actually it was actually the team from the digital agency that won, if they mm. call it winning, yeah. Yeah, well, sometimes a fresh perspective helps, right? And as, the challenge that you mentioned, where people get very attached to a solution and not attached to solving the problem, they, I think every product person can relate to that. I think we see that we've seen it happen everywhere. Um, awesome, thank you. Uh, now, Amok has a question. You mentioned that um, you were a customer before joining Vonto. Um, what inspired you to make the switch from uh, your previous business? Um, I was still doing my previous business on the side when I started mm. with Vonto. Um, like, to be perfectly blunt, I needed the money. <laughs> um, but I also, like, I, I had worked on a similar product concept when I had been at KPMG and um and really loved the, the, the problem space. I could see the potential of, of the product, but I, I, I could also experience that it wasn't there. Um, so when I joined, I actually as it, I actually joined the team for an offsite two weeks before I officially joined. Um, and I think part of the reason why we got the feedback from the board when we did was because without realising it, I sat down next to the guy from Group Strategy at the drinks. And um, so he asked me about my experience as a customer and I said to him, it's like, ah. Oh, I don't love it, but I really want to. And mm. he was like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, it's great that you're on board and stuff. And I think that's that feedback kind of got through the, the product because he then asked me why, of course. Um, and so I think that was part of the direction we then got from the board. Was, like, I, could, I could genuinely see that if it was done right, this product could have huge value. Um, yeah. and I think it's, as a small business owner, it's so hard. Like anything we can do to help, I think, is a, is a really positive thing. Yeah, indeed, um, and I, I I resonate with that experience. I I applied for a couple of roles. And I was like, this this product has so much potential, but it right now it's just a bit where where life is getting recorded. It it could be better um, before I become too German in my language. Um, okay, good. Um, actually, one of the things um, that I want to call out is uh, it sounds like you've done a great job like when you created the the, the personas originally and put them on a on a cardboard and made it really visible in in the team i i always like, back in the days when i was a founder i wasn't too sure like what the purpose of personas is and how to use them and then once i learned it's like oh my god how can you go without but it's it's really hard to sort of create that awareness across everyone who the customers what their needs are and um and, and sort of their current behavior i know at at last in we had a couple of um uh, actually, they were they were like um, uh, like game cards that sort of size personas that everyone could have on their desk and sort of browse through, um, which helped. But um, 
Do you have any, any thoughts on how to do that really effectively in a remote world other than just, you know, sticking it on a mural board or mural and telling people, hey, you know, have a look at it or presenting it? Yeah, yeah. how's it on a mural board? <laughs> I'm not sure I've got a better answer than that at the moment. Um, yeah, we, like we, we, I guess as most people do, like we, we really try and bring out the character of each of the mm. people um, so that you can then refer to them in conversations as you want to. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just really hard, right? Like you can you can discuss it once, but the value really comes from when you look at it every day, and when you remind yourself of financial of of the of the foundations, like you know your top three goals, having them somewhere where you look at them every day, so you don't get too distracted, right? And I think that's actually one of the problems in 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 working remotely that we still have to solve is we we can put things somewhere, but that doesn't mean we look at them every day. In fact. Uh, well, yeah. I'm not sharing my browser, but I think I've got about 100 tabs open. <laughs> you know, all important stuff, sure. And yeah, yeah. all right, we'll, um, we'll keep thinking about that one. If anyone online has an idea on how to solve that problem, um, please, uh, please share and we'll, we'll put you up on the, on the screen. Um, okay, uh, one last question on this. Um, we'll make this the last one before we move to, to Amok's talk. Um, is uh, from Maria. Um, what are the key indicators that the product was... Um, was ready for a, uh, that the product was ready for a beta release and didn't make any changes to the product from user testing before it was released into beta. Um, so we the way we treated it was to well, our plan was to go from alpha, so a very small group of you know no more than fifty um, users that we could you know personally on board really hold their hands through and get a lot of feedback because we we knew the alpha version of the product wasn't going to be great. Um, and so we were then going to get the feedback through that process to then work out what did it need to achieve for beta to be okay um, for it to release into the beta um, pool. So we had, when we did that survey, we asked people if they were interested in being part of our beta community. So we had, like from the beginning, we had, you know, a decent number. It was something that we were, um, we had a target around increasing our wait list before beta, beta release. Um, so we were aiming to get a 1,000 um, tech startup founders on that list. Um, so we wanted to make sure the product was good enough that, it, again, that focus on making sure they wanted to come back at least once a week. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of, it, we, we've like highly, I tend to be highly iterative in the way I work. Like, I've, you know, when we started out that user testing process, I had no idea we were going to do, whether we'd do two or ten rounds mm -hmm. of user testing. Um, I, I tend to wait to see what comes out of it and then we'll make a decision yeah. on how we progress. Um, yeah. But it sounds like you were you were looking for the early indicators of behavior change, right? To like that, like that that what they're seeing now is, as you said, good enough for them to have a look again next week. Um, yeah. Okay. Did did you find add on question to that? Did you find that your, I guess, rough gut feel and estimation of um, um, like how many people roughly would would come back and use it? Did that match then the the metrics that you've seen in in terms of retention? We've actually, so this is the big spoiler at the end. Uh, we've actually been acquired by the bank now. And so we've unfortunately didn't even get to finish building the alpha version. And um, we've now had right. to shift strategy again um, to, to more of the enterprise platform play. Um, yeah. Which is, right. yeah, like it, in a way, it's great because, you know, if we're going from 25,000 users, which are getting ready to scale up to a million. Mm. Um, but yeah, we didn't get to progress this, which is. Um, you know, I guess your comment on being attached to the problem rather than the solution is very valid in this case, but um, All right. nice this say no more, say no more. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Faith. Uh, thanks for sharing. Awesome journey. Um, and, uh, and thanks for, for taking the time to, um, yeah, invest in the community and, um, and let everyone learn from all your success and, um, all the things that can be better in the future. Um, give everyone, uh, uh, sorry, everyone give a big hand to Faith. Um, I will take you off the screen now. Um, you have a great evening. Um, and, um, and we're going now to Amok, um, who will uh, also look at a lot of the you know, product best practices, but um, tell us where we're going wrong and, um, and you know, what doesn't necessarily apply. So um, that should be a good balance. Uh, Amok, you ready? Over to you. Cool, cool. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me, Ben. So today we're going to be talking about PM 102, the classic lies in product. So, you know, when it comes to the 101 
of anything, uh, whether it's uh, thermodynamics or you know mechanics or a new language. I think uh, you know the concepts that we learn in a one on one class are usually pretty black and white. Uh, that makes sense because uh, our brains can only sort of uh, cope with so much at once. Uh, but of course, the real world has a lot more nuance to it, and that's sort of where you know the real world is a bit more grey than black and white. Uh, and yeah, today we're going to be looking at this grey uh, when it comes to product and how uh, some of those classic uh, one-on-one concepts that we learn, uh, well, they need a bit more nuance uh, to the realities of uh, product management. Cool, cool. So let's get started. I think the the first principle <clears throat> is uh, the classic, uh, you know, say no. I think uh, this is peak product, if I could say that. I think uh, it's something we hear all the time. Uh, I think we all know that classic Steve Jobs quote, uh, you know, around focusing, but then also around being proud of the things you say no to. Uh, I think there's a general, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, obviously, like it makes sense, right? Uh, you got to say no because you need to bring focus. You need some way to bring cohesion into what you're doing. And if you don't do that, you end up with this hodgepodge and you're heading in all these different directions at the same time. Uh, and that's just a mess. Uh, but I think uh, in, in practice, I think uh, we sometimes tend to misunderstand this. And so I would go as far as to say, actually, maybe let's try to say yes uh, before we say no as a general principle. So. When a new idea comes around, right, uh, whether it's a uh, sales uh, person, uh, sales teammate coming up with an idea, coming to you with an idea, or whether it's a design teammate, whether uh, it's an engineer and so on, I think at the end of the day, right, uh, this new idea is going to be super rough. Uh, you know, people may come to the idea, uh, come with you, uh, uh, come to you with an idea, but not necessarily know, you know, the, the real rationale around why they're asking for this, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, it's going to be rough and it's almost never going to be uh, so fully formed to actually sway all that inertial inertia, uh, that current inertia that you have, uh, you, you know, you, you naturally have so much, uh, uh, so much inertia to keep things going in this existing direction. And so it's almost unfair to expect this new idea to have that sway on that. And so it actually feels fairer to first try build on this new idea with a yes. Uh, you know, find out all the ways it could actually work, uh, find out all the ways it could actually be, uh, you know, the rightful thing before you try to see all the ways that it can't and so on in some sense. And I think uh, it's hard to do that, right? It's a lot easier to say no. It's a lot easier to sort of deflect with a no. And uh, that's why it's actually super important, in fact, because uh, yes requires this active listening, yes requires this empathy, and yes is sort of how, even though it's harder to do, you can actually empower uh, other people in the product to influence it. Yes is sort of how you can go from uh, a rough, crazy idea to a good, crazy idea and sort of discover those uh, gems. So I think uh, an analogy that comes to mind with this is uh, around uh, venture capital, in fact. So Pat Grady, this is a great thread I came across uh, just a few weeks ago. He's a partner at Sequoia Capital. And he writes about how when he first started uh, BC, whenever a new deal would come around, his uh, you know modus operandi, his default way of operating was to kind of go, okay, how... Uh, you know, what are all the things uh, that are wrong about this deal? You know, here's one thing, here's one thing, here's another thing. And here's, you know, here are all these reasons why we shouldn't uh, invest in this thing. And in fact, as he evolved, he came to realize that actually a big part of his job was to figure out what's right. It's almost like, uh, you know, despite all of these other wrong things, uh, I have so much conviction because of this one right thing to make a decision to invest. And he talks about how it's actually so much harder to do that. It's so much harder to, to find what's, out, uh, what's right rather than what's wrong when it's a, a rough new idea. And of course, uh, you know, the analogy uh, is, is uh, of course, product is slightly different, uh, you know, when it comes to product where uh, it's, uh, you know, we're deciding between, let's say, having something on a roadmap that's a bit different to deciding to invest millions uh, on a new deal. Uh, but I think the analogy sort of uh, roughly holds well there uh, around trying to say yes before we first start saying no. So uh, I think a more concrete example is uh, from my time uh, working on Easel. So like Ben mentioned, uh, I'm working on the startup right now. And uh, to 
talk through the example, let's maybe go back a few years. So um, I was a product manager at Intercom at the time. I was working in Dublin. And uh, I was just sort of struggling to find the docs that I needed to do my job. Uh, you know, something was in Google Docs, something was in uh, Coda and so on. And uh, I just figured, okay, I surely cannot be the only one that's suffering from this. It feels uh, like an obviously painful problem for everyone. And so uh, I thought, okay, there's a cool business opportunity here. And that's when I reached out to uh, who's now my co-founder, uh, my mate, to talk about this. And we figured, okay, cool. Uh, let's build uh, API integrations uh, with all these different apps and just have you know one place to search across all these apps. Fairly straightforward, right? I'll just plug into the APIs and then expose one search box for all the docs. That sounds uh, a great idea. So we started looking into that, right? We started looking into things like the Google Docs API. We started looking into how an infrastructure for, for something like this could scale, uh, how would we support new apps, uh, keep up with different APIs, things like that, and how would we make this efficient? Because obviously API calls, uh, you know, when you search something, it shouldn't be taking seconds to get your results back. It should feel really quick. And so we started looking into these kinds of things. It was obviously very technical, uh, not our forte, but it made sense. You know, we were heading deep into this uh, API uh, sort of thinking. And then sort of out of nowhere, uh, my colleague suggested, uh, you know, hey, what if we use browser history uh, instead of APIs? Uh, you know, what if we use the browser as this interface to all your apps and your browser history as this uh, way to, you know, discover all the docs uh, that you have and uh, use that to connect with um, all your work? And that was, uh, was bizarre. Right, it was uh, really unusual of an idea, and at face value, uh, it sort of uh, made no sense to me, uh, to be honest. And uh, it, it kind of felt too simple. It felt very limiting. And, and uh, yeah, we we you know some of the obvious things that that stuck to me, uh, that struck to me were you know well, what about the non-browser stuff? Uh, obviously, I'm accessing some docs that aren't in the browser. What about that? You know, the browser history is not going to have that. Uh, what about stuff that I haven't seen? Surely there's things uh, that I haven't seen that I want to access and well, that won't be in my history. Uh, something about browser history just feels invasive. It just feels <laughs> weird to imagine building an app on something like that. It just feels like it would make people super privacy conscious right away. It just doesn't feel right. And uh, it also did, didn't really feel as powerful as APIs. I mean, APIs <laughs> are literally built uh, for this very purpose, like they're built so you can use them to plug into different apps. And here we're sort of suggesting this really wild idea to not use the very thing that uh, that apps build to interface with them and sort of use this other thing with the browser. And so uh, this was really one of those, okay, let's pause and let's try to say yes before we just kind of just give a hard no uh, kind of moments. And that's sort of uh, uh, what we did, and I'm, I'm really glad we did. Uh, you'll see in a bit. So we, we did that, and we started reflecting, right? We were uh, trying to see uh, how uh, this could actually make sense. You know, what are all the ways this could make sense? And we realized that, OK, uh, right now, how I'm accessing docs is really with this address bar trial and error, right? I'm just going to the address bar, I'm trying to typing a few keywords and I'm trying to get to uh, what I want. And really what we're trying to build is a better version of this, right? Uh, just something that's better than this. And so uh, if you kind of start from that, you realize, okay, well, it looks like most of the time I'm just working in the browser. You know, most of the time I'm just actually just accessing things uh, from here, just accessing links really. And it feels like, okay, most of the time I'm actually just finding stuff I've seen, uh, right, in that address file. And actually, if you think about it, uh, if we use the browser history and build a, a browser extension, well, we can just work fully local. Uh, and actually, that would make it faster and actually even more <laughs> secure than an API-based solution. And in fact, if we're using the browser, we can interact with the web page as well, right? Now we can uh, take actions on the web page itself. You've got the whole DOM of the page. Uh, you can index content there and stuff like that. And then there are all these other benefits that we hadn't even thought of uh, around how, okay, if it's in the browser, this thing will work with anything, you know, even an internal company tool. 
and it will just be easier to maintain, right? We won't have to play catch up with these APIs and, and um, deal with those uh, scaling challenges uh, that we probably have, inconsistencies between APIs, things like that. And so uh, that, that really was uh, a huge, uh, you know, a critical decision for us as a company uh, that really started off as this super rough, super crazy <laughs> idea at face value. And it went from there to uh, something that's essentially become the foundation of Easel uh, today. So uh, much of the company is really, uh, I would say, uh, built upon this. And, and a lot of the progress that we've made has been because of this rough, crazy idea that's become this uh, really, really good, crazy idea. And um, uh, that's it, right? And we, we actually did it. We ended up with this search across these apps without, um, without integrating with these uh, tools using their APIs. So it was uh, a crazy, uh, uh, crazy kind of thing to, to uh, get to uh, from there. And uh, what's interesting to point out is that, you know, not only was this really, uh, really a, a foundation for our company, uh, from a rough idea to the foundation of our company, it's uh, actually been an inspiration for other people as well in this space. So a YC competitor, for instance, that was uh, you know, four millions in three years in, uh, had built more than 600 API integrations, sort of pivoted to using this browser history, um, this approach that we have. And so I think the main, main sort of uh, call out there is that it's really important to challenge ourselves to say yes, uh, you know, even if it's for a little bit uh, before we say no. It's really much harder to, to do. It requires us to listen, but it's really how we can discover some gems. And uh, I would say, you know, rightfully give the space to a rough new idea to grow some legs before we deflect it uh, as a no. I think, of course, the caveat here is that uh, we can't possibly be spending, you know, tons and tons of time on every trickle of thought. And so this is kind of where we need to be making our judgments. But yeah, uh, just challenge yourself to say yes, just for a little bit at the very least. Cool. So another principle uh, is around problems. I mean, um, we love problems as uh, product managers. I think, uh, do you even product manage if you don't, uh, you know, respond to every statement with, uh, but what problem does that solve? Uh, I think uh, it makes sense, right? Uh, it's a big part of our job, uh, things to do with problems. Uh, I think uh, it's on us to sort of uh, help the team build empathy with the problem and get clarity with the problem and so on. It's just that sometimes, some of that really stellar stuff, well, it actually doesn't start with the problem. Um, you know, sometimes it's actually okay to start with the solution. Sometimes it's actually okay to you know, get inspired by some funky new tech and see how that could actually apply to the context of your product. Sometimes it's okay to uh, look at some existing uh, you know, uh, opportunity that you have based on your existing product and uh, work backwards from there. Uh, these are, I would say, the wouldn't it be cool ideas. And uh, they're a totally valid place to start. In fact, I, I, I personally feel that, you know, these ideas, uh, well, this can, you know, take you places where linear uh, problem to design to build doesn't really take you. Uh, it, 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 you know, there's a certain creative element to it where if we give each other space to bounce ideas without necessarily, you know, abruptly cutting it down to stuff from the problem because we really want to be first principles, uh, there's a certain value in letting those creative juices flow for a little bit and starting with this solution. And so uh, let's see a concrete example of that. Well, uh, this story sort of begins with uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, like I think all great stories should. So someone in Poland watched this uh, great movie and thought, okay, well, this voice control stuff, uh, that's pretty neat. I think uh, this should be a thing in real life. And so this person in Poland started to um, do just that. And they started working on this uh, text-to-speech technology. And uh, it was working pretty well. And then Amazon came along and uh, did what Amazon usually does, which is uh, acquire. And then uh, there, from there, Amazon uh, sort of used this technology to uh, uh, build this uh, Echo, right? Uh, so this was the first uh, first voice control for music uh, device uh, that was built. And then someone inside Amazon, who uh, pretty much got inspired by Star Trek, thought, okay, well, this uh, voice control for music stuff feels pretty cool, but I think it can uh, be a bit bigger than that. And that's sort of where Alexa ended up. Uh, and uh, that's the Alexa that we see today. And so, 
I think the, the fun thing to point out there is that this really wasn't the result of, uh, at the very start, at, the, at least, of uh, some you know, big strategic thinking of how, uh, uh, and big strategic thinking and uh, you know, problem first thinking around voice control and so on. It was really just uh, someone, some people, I should say, getting inspired by uh, sci fi thinking uh, this was really cool tech. And of course, uh, at the end of the day, uh, through the process, I'm sure there were many discussions had around the problems that this was solving, uh, whether this would be something people want and so on. But uh, there's definitely uh, you know, something to be said about these ideas that just start from solutions. Uh, another uh, anecdote is from uh, the, what we're working on at Easel. And so you know, this search across apps thing that we had built using the browser history, well, that was pretty cool. And we were using it ourselves and we had some users. And then you know, it just sort of occurred to us, well, it'd be handy if I could actually take actions from here. It'd be handy if I could you know, just make a new doc from here as well, make a new GitHub issue from here as well, because I know we're, I'm doing that all the time and now I'm searching it easy. I feel like it would be nice to just be able to create a new issue from here as well, uh, create a new doc from here as well. And we kind of had empathy with the problem ourselves and you know, we just kind of did it. <laughs> uh, it felt like uh, a quick uh, thing for us to do. And, uh, the fun thing is that this actually, uh, when we launched it, you know, some users were actually saying, well, I'm using this new commands thing uh, more than I'm actually using this new search thing. I actually like this commands thing more than I like your actual search thing. And that was a total surprise for us. So I think uh, the main sort of thing to point out there is that I think it's uh, inevitable that we will need to figure out uh, if it's something people want. I think uh, it would be a lie if I said that that doesn't matter. I think that's super important and that's always pretty much uh, where we have to ground ourselves at the end of the day. Uh, but it's really, really okay to let our creative mind wander uh, and bounce ideas freely, especially at the start. Cool. So another principle is around uh, not, uh, as in uh, if you're not embarrassed, uh, you shift too late. So I think this is a, another classic one. Uh, it's a classic uh, Reed Hoffman quote uh, that I'm sort of paraphrasing. And he's gone on to clarify this later on as well. But I, I generally think this, this uh, you know, tends to get misused. Now, at face value, what it's trying to uh, get at is, hey, uh, start small, you know, keep tight spo uh, scope, and don't, uh, don't sweat the details uh, for some elusive perfection state. You know, that's not going to happen. Uh, just get stuff out the door uh, and uh, really get that cupcake out the door. And uh, I think the issue with that is the fuzziness of the word embarrassed, right? Uh, what does that really mean? And so I would really actually go as far as to just say, let's just not ship if we're embarrassed. Why I'm saying that is that there's, there's risk, right? Uh, the risk, if we're okay being embarrassed, is that we could potentially be shipping stuff that's just really bad, uh, stuff that's just really bad uh, that uh, no one can really use. And well, at the end of the day, it doesn't really help us learn anything, right? I mean, an example of the prime weak cupcake, I would call it, is uh, something where, uh, hey, you're not really confident about it uh, being valuable. You're not really confident uh, what you're going to learn. Uh, you've got something you're not super proud of, but you, know, you get that out the door. Uh, because, well, it's a cupcake, right? So it's okay if we're embarrassed by it. And I think uh, the, the purpose that that serves is really, uh, I would say, negligible. In fact, it ends up costing more time because inevitably what happens is you get that out the door uh, and you really don't learn anything, right? You just see that people are confused and people don't end up using it and uh, you kind of need to come back to the drawing board then. Uh, I think the thing to keep in mind there is that just scoping it down doesn't make it a cupcake. And in fact, uh, it still needs to be edible. And in fact, uh, I actually think, uh, given how uh, things work today, given how attention spans are only like you know, diminishing, I would almost go as far as to say the cupcake actually really needs to taste good as well. I think there needs to be some level of delight in the, uh, even in the cupcake. And uh, there needs to be, you know, at the end of the day, some baseline value someone can attract, uh, extract. There needs to be some baseline thing that you're confident you're going to be able to learn. And really, at the end of the day, you shouldn't be embarrassed about that, right? Uh, so an example here uh, is from uh, this side project that I had. So I, uh, when I quit Intercom, I, I was dabbling in a few side projects, and this is one of them. And this was analytics for Intercom. And this is a uh, integration with Intercom to just kind of get some charts out of the box uh, with one click on your Intercom data. And the 
uh, this was, you know, the, the cupcake. And uh, I think it was a borderline cupcake, right? Uh, I think it was uh, uh, something that worked. It wasn't like it was totally broken. You, would, you know, sign up and you could actually use this. Uh, but it really just had you know, this gooeyness to it. It was like a gooey cupcake, if I can say. There were tons of these uh, you know, subtle arbitrary decisions that we had uh, sort of just dropped in the product right? Uh, something uh, around the user definition. So the users were defined as uh, someone that was seen in the last 60 days and churn was defined as not seen in the last 90 days, uh, not seen for more than 90 days. Uh, a pie chart would just show you the top five values and just sort of drop the other things. Uh, when you would bootstrap the app, uh, you would get like a, uh, hey, wait for 10 minutes uh, message and you would kind of just need to come back to this on your own and, and see uh, 10 minutes later that your app was set up. Um, there was no reminder there. So I think there were all these, uh, I would say, uh, subtle things that we had placed in the product that made it gooey. And uh, I wasn't really proud. I was kind of embarrassed by it. I you know, was potentially not even going to like uh, talk about it with my intercom uh, ex-colleagues. I was uh, not comfortable about it. Uh, but, you know, it just felt like, it was a cupcake, so we should get this out the door. We should, you know, keep lean and start learning and, and uh, start small somewhere. Well, you know, shocker, it just didn't really work out, right? Uh, people were confused uh, about this, and they weren't really able to extract uh, value from the charts because of those subtle nuances in, the, in how the data was presented. And it really made sense, right? Uh, we were confused ourselves, <laughs> but we kind of just felt like we had to get this cupcake out. And so I think, I think the 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 purpose of getting something out i mean there was really no purpose at the end of the day there wasn't really anything we were uh, hoping to get out of this uh and at the end of the day it just sort of slowed us down because uh, we had to pause there and sort of circle back and think through things more systematically to build a correct uh you know data model there uh, and that's sort of where we ended up with uh, and i would say all, all of that you know initial back and forth just essentially cost us a month uh, so, I mean, this isn't a huge success story now. It's still just a really small indie project uh, on the side and, uh, and making me a few thousands on the side. But I think the main sort of takeaway there is really to, uh, I would say, have reasonable belief that at least someone will use what you're building and find it helpful, right? I think uh, there's almost no point getting something out the door, uh, uh, whether it's quote unquote a cupcake or not. And I think at the end of the day, it really needs to be doing something that someone will find helpful. And I think the cupcake uh, comes in the fact that, you know, it's okay if it doesn't do much. Uh, in fact, it's probably uh, critical for you to just keep focused there, but it really needs to do that one thing uh, well, right? Mm -hmm. So it's okay uh, if you feel uneasy that it's not a wedding cake with all these other features, but uh, it really does uh, need to be able to do that one thing really well. Cool. So uh, I think uh, another classic uh, way of thinking, I should say, when it comes to uh, 101 is around uh, this belief that people care, right? And I think people uh, care about what we're doing here. People have this affinity and relationship with the brand. And, you know, if we release something new, they'll try it out. And if something's not working, they're going to, uh, you know, really be upset, really, really upset about it. And uh, they'll want, want to see how something we build is going to help with their day-to-day -day workflows. And of course, I think uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, I think our product is really not as important as we think it is uh, in the world views of our users. I think uh, what happens is that you know, you know when we're spending eight hours, five days a week working on this thing uh, as part of our job, we are sort of falling victim to focusing illusion, right? We we overweight how important this stuff is. Uh, you're usually using, uh, if it makes sense, you're usually using the app in the company as, as well. You're usually probably one of the, the power users in the company as well. And uh, things like that also don't help. And uh, I think that's kind of where if you forget that, and if you uh, forget that, you know, uh, this, this asymmetry, you end up doing silly things, right? You end up thinking that, uh, people will care uh, when you release something new, right? And you expect people to switch over to your app uh, and just drop their existing habits that, uh, that they've had for ages. And they're not going to do that. You expect people will invite their teammates uh, when they're just discovering the app themselves. I mean, they're not going to do that. They're not going to stick their neck out. Uh, that's, that's the big fear that they would have. 
uh, around uh, maintaining some sort of uh, you know status with the team, etc., uh, credibility with the team. And I think you you think that uh, you know when there's a new product tour or something new, people are really going to want to experiment and and, and you know, go through the tour. Well, in fact, they just want to use the app to do that one thing and get on with their day. So I think it's really around, around uh, acknowledging this reality that people have and keeping that in mind when we're doing all the product work. And so I think uh, a fun story here is from my time at Intercom. Now, Intercom, uh, you know, internally, uh, they've just literally yesterday actually finally changed uh, this. But uh, I would say for, for the longest time, Intercom's positioning was, as, uh, was like this uh, customer communication platform, right? This sort of one place to uh, aggregate all of your uh, touch points with your customer, whether it's, you know, support or marketing and so on. It's like this one platform where you interface with your customers through and uh, uh, that was that was cool, right? I, we were drinking that Kool Aid really hard in the company. I mean, uh, we were focused on sales teams, uh, the 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 part of the product that I was on. And man, like our inter- intercom sales team, uh, we used intercom so much, right? It was really uh, uh, the the lifeline, I would say, of how leads were coming in, how we were nurturing them how account executives were then progressing them through to close, et cetera. And, you know, chat was a big part of that. So this was really the the uh, heart of how we were thinking uh, users would be thinking of us as well. And, of course, I think when it came down to it, we would have chats with our customers. And it wasn't so much this customer communication platform as much as it was just, oh, yeah, Intercom, it's this web chat thing that we have on the marketing side and oh yeah you you know it's just this chat that we get leads from and i think uh you know it was a huge sort of uh, surprise for us uh, and perhaps it shouldn't have been but yeah in their world there was salesforce that was a, a much bigger part of their worldview there was sales loft and marketo and linkedin there was a lot more to their worldview than this intercom thing that we were building and now, of course, part of it is uh, around positioning, you know, us uh, demonstrating how Intercom can be a bigger part of their worldview than it is today. But I think part of it is also just around acknowledging that this is the reality that people have, right? And this is basically the world that we need to now fit into. And uh, so we did both, right? Uh, so we did a bit of fitting in. So I think we uh, acknowledged that there were two big pillars like Salesforce and Marketo that a lot of sales team ran on. And uh, we integrated deeply with them. We had landing pages, you know, focused specifically on that. We had an app store's listing on that, et cetera. So that was a big part of uh, what we started doubling down on. And then we also acknowledged this uh, when we positioned Intercom. So we acknowledged that, oh, you know what? Yeah, we are just that messenger that people love, right? But we can also do other things, you know, but we also do bots, apps, product tools, and things like that. You know, you may want to check that out as well. And so you can see how there's this level of, you know, acknowledging the reality that people have and then, uh, you know, building a bridge to the world you want to make. So I think that's really the main takeaway there is to uh, understand the, the worldviews that people have, uh, not for what you want them to be, but for what they are, uh, <laughs> as much as may uh, it may hurt to realize this reality, uh, but then acknowledge that truth and then build a bridge to this world you want to be making Cool. So another principle is around prioritization. So I think we love uh, models in product land. I think uh, especially with prioritization, I mean, prioritization is probably one of the hardest things that we do, I think. Uh, And so you name it, there are so many ways of thinking that. There's, you know, Rice and a few other models. Uh, We look at industry trends and strategy and so on. And I think think at the end of the day, uh, what we sometimes forget is really uh, there's only, you know, one truth to all of these things, right? All of these concepts, they're kind of abstract things that we're working off. And really at the end of the day, the closest thing to reality is problems, right? And so when prioritizing, it's really just critical to stay grounded on problems people have because there's nothing uh, closer to the truth in our world than problems. And so I think uh, time for another story here. So as a reminder, like this was that easel thing with search across apps with the browser history. So we, we had that thing and, you know, as a company, we went, cool, you know, this is great. People are using this. Uh, I think uh, there's some, you know, strong retention, but we aren't growing enough. So how do we, you know, get user growth? Well, I know virality, right? That sounds great. Product-led growth. Let's just get some viral thing in there. And, 
you know, uh, that sounds uh, intuitive, I guess, at face value. And I thought, okay, well, obviously, the viral thing, well, it's just got to be sharing. That just makes so much sense in our context, right? You're searching docs, share the docs as well. That sounds like an intuitive action to take from Easel. Uh, and so that's sort of what we did. You know, it, it felt intuitive. Uh, you just select a few docs uh, from there, hit the share button, type in an email there, and then boom, the person uh, you just emailed will receive this, uh, will receive the docs that you had selected from Easel and they'll get like a powered by Easel thing that they could click and then discover Easel. Boom, we've got that viral loop. And so this was the, the uh, you know, thinking that we had, and it sort of worked backwards, I would say, from this uh, wishful, I would say, cloud of virality. Uh, and it didn't, in the end, really work from uh, stay grounded on those problems. I think we definitely didn't spend enough time on this when it comes to this piece, uh, thinking through the real uh, habits that people have today when it came to, uh, to sharing. And so, in fact, when we uh, rolled this out as a very small beta to like 10, 20 people, you know, we realized this, oh yeah, Slack, right? Uh, Slack is how people share today. They copy link and just paste that in Slack. And that's an existing habit that they've reinforced so much. And so sure, there are some problems around sharing that I think we can still tackle. Uh, I think it's still on the table for Easel, but it just wasn't something we had even actively thought about. We hadn't actively thought about this existing habit <clears throat> that um, people have on Slack and the problems around that and, and so on. We were just sort of, uh, you know, really just pinned on this virality dimension and the benefits of that for Easel. And so I think the, the main sort of takeaway there is let's just not get lost in, you know, the, the rice scores and the industry trends and all that. Let's not get too lost in these abstract worlds. I think they're still important to dabble in, but I think at the end of the day, Let's just really stay grounded on problems people have because, yeah, that's the closest thing to reality. Cool. So I'm just going to wrap up there. I think the uh, funniest way to demonstrate this nuance when it comes to product, I think, is uh, this thread that I came across. Again, this is just something I came across last week, and I just thought it was relevant. Uh, Brandon Chu is a really great product leader. I, I imagine you've probably read some of his stuff uh, at Shopify. And he uh, wrote a, a really cool thread about how in Shopify they swing the pendulum and how that's really one of their favorite operating principles uh, going from, you know, one extreme in some sense of um, operating to another extreme. And then funnily enough, it just re reminded me of this uh, podcast I had had three years ago or two years ago from Paul Adams at Intercom, who's another, again, a great product leader, talking about how you should really avoid pendulum swings when problem solving. And I think uh, it's really, you know, two great product leaders kind of saying the opposite things. And at the end of the day, of course, there's a lot of nuance in the different contexts that they're saying this in. And that's uh, sort of the note that I want to be wrapping up on is that, uh, yeah, nuance is key. Uh, sometimes we're misapplying the 101 and sometimes it just doesn't apply. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think uh, you sort of know best. I think uh, once you get the hang of that 101 and you start you know, getting into that 102, I think uh, you sort of uh, know when to uh, apply what and apply that nuance. Cool. Uh, just the last thing is that uh, the talk that I just gave is sort of actually based on um, a blog that I wrote. Uh, so there are a few other... Uh, PM102 principles that I cover on that blog. So if you found this interesting, you may find other uh, other uh, sort of uh, counterintuitive PM102 principles that we cover on the blog interesting too. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amok. Um, uh, yep, we can take the, the screen. Well, we can, yeah, we'll, we can take the screen, uh, the slides off. All right, uh, same deal, everyone online. Uh, put your questions in the chat and um, we'll pick them up one by one. Um, and yep, give them a, a big hand. Now, um, I've got a, a question to start with. So you worked in with, with Intercom and Atlassian, at the very least, two organizations which have um, you know, really great world-class product culture and, and understanding of product as well. Um, and, um, and a lot of people that seem like work in startups don't necessarily have the, the, the luxury of that. And so uh, when it comes to saying yes, for example, I've seen a lot of founders and hear stories of a lot of founders who become quite unreasonable very quickly in, in their demands and what they, what they happen and, and don't fully understand what they're really asking the teams to do. They just want to see it happen as soon as possible. And it leads to a lot of 
pressure and at the end of the day, mental health issues. So how do you, what's your advice for, for balancing that and making sure that, or where do you sort of suggest drawing the line when it comes to saying yes? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think uh, at the end of the day, it's not like a great product comes from saying yes all the time. I definitely don't think that's the case. I think uh, essentially there's a lot of truth to that 101. And so I think uh, the the main sort of nuance that I'm trying to uh, point out there is that uh, there is a value in uh, acknowledging what someone is saying and really in- engaging with that, right? I think, uh, so I do improv comedy, right? And I think a great uh, analogy comes to mind there is when you're on stage, mm. you know, when you're doing improv comedy, when someone presents an idea, it's, uh, it, you know, one way of uh, doing it is to just totally deflect it. But uh, it's almost like it, acknowledging uh, the idea that someone brings up, right, on stage as a gift that they're yeah. offering you and uh, using that as a way to go uh, from there. And so, I, 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 sorry, I think the analogy is a bit uh, abstract here. I think what I'm really trying to get at is that at the end of the day, uh, it's important to remember that uh, at the end of the day, everyone is really on the same team. I think usually the goals that people have are aligned. So if someone is bringing something to you, uh, either their goals are totally misaligned from yours, in which case I think that's another discussion. But I think usually there's someone in your team. Uh, usually uh, they probably want, if you know, even if they're a customer, right, they usually just are suggesting something that will help them do their mm-hmm. job, right? And then that's totally in line with what you want to be doing. Yeah. So I think usually starting with a yes is a better place because uh, you are essentially acknowledging it. Now, it's not, yes, let's do this. It's more like a yes, I let's try to unpack why you're asking that. And uh, mm-hmm. you try to understand that. And I think uh, as you start unpacking that and as you start unpacking really your own books as well and the realities of your existing roadmap, I think the the uh, alignment sort of just happens uh, organically in some sense. Now, of mm. course, at some point, we might still just have to make a tough decision and just say, sorry, just really, no, I know we're misaligned here, but we just need to keep moving. But I think uh, where I see the, the say no being misplayed is people sort of just defaulting to no, right? I think there's just this, yeah. sorry, like, no, we just don't have time for that. And I think that's uh, doing sort of disservice to your teammates in their ability to influence product and uh, disservice to the product as well, because... Uh, they're gems, right? I think there are people yeah. bringing up things uh, and offering as gifts in some way for the product. That's yeah. the the uh, improv terminology there. Like it's yeah. just a gift that someone's offering that you should acknowledge at least. Yeah. No, I I hundred percent agree. And actually, I I love the example that you brought, right? With how do we use the browser browser history, right? And it'll seem completely crazy to some, and mm-hmm. um, actually there's merit in that. And it reminds me of the the old um, Airbnb story, right? right? Was like, how about we rent apartments, uh, like rooms in apartments and let strangers stay there? Doesn't make sense, right? But it's like, well, actually, Mm. but if you manage it in the right way, there's huge potential in that. Um, Mm. And um, and actually in my... Uh, in my first startup, we we had sort of a similar moment where we're like, well, shit, we want to access APIs from Facebook and from uh, from LinkedIn, etc. But they're starting to shut down. Do we want to invest six months in trying to convince them that we're going to be a good partner and um, and good to their data, and you know, only for them to just keep closing it down later and later? And we're going to you know, risk our business on that. Or do we build a browser extension and actually don't even tell them about us, but, but you know, <laughs> open, essentially use the front end as APIs, right? Open their pages yeah. in the background um, when the user logged in and, and uh, mm. extract some of the data to bring the value to the customer. Um, so, yeah, we, we did something similar there, which then had other issues, but, um, but that's a story <laughs> for another day. So um, mm. it was interesting how close the, the thinking patterns there were. Um, okay, so um, you you mentioned um, working with a sales team, right? Mm. And, you know, and so sales is always an, an interesting one. Um, mm. and often the ways of thinking in sales are exactly contradictory to the ways of thinking mm. in, in product, right? And, and salespeople are uh, incentivized to get the next sale. So a lot of, and, you know, mm. that means there's great product teams and, and great sales teams out there, but often the conversations with sales are something like, can you build this because it'll help me win this one customer? And as product teams are like, well, I don't care about your one customer. I care about the next thousand or 10,000, right? Yeah. Um, and so so um, sometimes it becomes 
hard to have the conversations about you know, scalable problems when one person or a, a collection of people are incentivized by making sure that one person is or one customer is happy. How do you balance that in your approach and um, and sort of yeah get to alignment? Um, whether it's you know saying yes or no, whether it's you know like just generally yeah. operating as a PM. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think whenever it comes to alignment, the first thing I would say is uh, it really comes down to uh, a, like higher order alignment. I guess it's like top down alignment is the easiest sort of way to build alignment rather than let's try to bicker about this very small thing about this very specific feature. I think it's really like top down. And again, if you start from the top down, I think uh, there's this obvious realization that okay, cool, like sales, sales and product, like we're we're all in the same product. Thing, right like we're all in the same business and really at the end of the day we're all just trying to uh, grow revenue at the most of the time and i think uh, that's sort of the first uh, layer of alignment and if you work backwards from there i think uh, that's when you can uh, start having those interesting discussions and so i think uh, there's no one uh, one uh, silver bullet way i think of approaching uh, sales uh, uh, but i think again Having this open mind when you're having conversations is really, I think, the key thing. And rem reminding, I think, all parties on the table around that high-level alignment that you have and working uh, working forwards from that. So I think uh, one example that I would have is, uh, well, I guess I have, like, two thoughts on that. One is that I actually wrote a blog on that. Like, I think sales in marketing teams in general, uh, collaborating with them as a product person is I generally think underutilized, or at least certainly from my experience, I think uh, not enough people are doing that uh, enough. I think uh, sales are talking to customers like way more than I think a product manager does uh, usually. Like I think we're talking about someone who's literally talking to people every single day. And mm -hmm. the key, you know, key part of their job is really to concretely understand uh, what are the problems that uh, the people that they're trying to sell to have because then they're going to try to explain how their solution is that uh, solution, um, uh, how their solution is the right thing for that problem. So I think, you know, these are people who have such a rich insight on the world of our customers, uh, especially, I think, not just the world uh, of how our product is used, but I think even just the world of our customers, you know, the reality that they have, like all the other tools that they have, all the other tools that they try, et cetera. So I think there's this mm -hmm. huge bucket of information. I think same goes with marketing, but that's another story. But yeah, like same goes with marketing, like huge bucket of information there. And I think, uh, uh, so So I think when, when again, like when a sales uh, salesperson comes, I think uh, to, to the table uh, with some idea, I think there's this, definitely some credibility to it. I think um, even if I think they, their perspective might, of course, be a bit more um, biased towards that one deal. Mm. One, one, one concrete funny story, I think, because uh, that comes to mind is, you know, usually I'd say most of the interactions usually end up with that makes a lot of sense, but, you know, we have like these other priorities and sure, like mm. this one deal could help us close, uh, you know, like XK dollars, but building this thing can then unlock uh, value for, you know, YK dollars, and that's a lot bigger number, right? Uh, so you'll be able to close more deals even better later on. So I think there's, there's, there's uh, you know, usually the discussions sort of go around there. But a funny story is actually at Intercom, uh, there was a time where we did did just that. Like there was a big customer that wanted something on a specific Salesforce integration. Mm. And actually the trade-off in my head was like, okay, so like how many dollars is this customer going to pay us? And okay, so like this, this one thing that's going to take... Uh, you know, a week, uh, a week of our time, like a week of one engineer time is going to like pretty much unlock like this much money for the business uh, right away. I think that makes sense. Right. I think, I think, in fact, that's rare to, to have that. Like it's so yeah. rare in product to have this clear ROI of the effort that you put in and the ROI. Yeah. Of yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah I've, I've seen decisions where, um, you know, like six months of, of like of a whole team were invested into something that the customer didn't end up buying. Um, and oh, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you've got sort of yeah, two ends of the spectrum there. Um, yeah. But I percent agree, right? It's, uh, it's almost like if you can get a customer to pay for the next, you know, three or six months of R&D um, to, to reach more customers, of course, it makes sense as a trade-off. So. Theoretically, mm -hmm. that the, the the tension between sales and product, if you're aligned on your on your priorities, shouldn't exist. The the other thing I will say um, that I think, um, well, certainly you know, Atlassian, I think we we both made that experience. Intercom, I, I can't say for sure, but I have the feeling it'll be similar. Is um, 
and it's it's underappreciated in Australia is just aligning the incentives of everyone in the business through stock options. And it's it's not mm. as common in Australia as it is in you know in the Bay Area and the US. And um, and so if um, if you have a sales team that's getting commission for each customer, and if you have a product management team that gets their salary and that's about it, um, then uh, yeah, it just creates a, a huge power imbalance in the in the company, but also it's um, yeah, it, it it just creates different incentives that are by design misaligning teams, um, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's um, uh, it's a shame to see these situations and and have people just get frustrated with it. Um, all righty, uh, no questions from the audience. You guys have one more minute if you have any questions for Amok, but if you're just so, uh, you know, if, if you just have a lot to digest, then um, that's all right as well. Um, all righty, um, I don't see anything, anyone typing, so we might just wrap it up. Um, again, thank you so much, Amok. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for spending the time, and thanks for dialing in from, is it Sri Lanka still? Oh, no, I'm actually back in Sydney now. <laughs> oh, you're back in Sydney. All right. Um, yeah. uh, all right. Well, hence hence the connection is so clear. Um, <laughs> okay, good. Um, well, I'll, uh, I'll take you off. Thanks so much. You have an awesome evening. And um, everyone else, thank you so much for joining. Um, one last announcement. Um, if you want to get involved in whichever way, uh, again, reach out, benatprioritize.com. I think I've, I've seen a couple of people add me on LinkedIn. Very happy for you to do that as well. Um, we have a couple of really awesome talks uh, lined up for April. Uh, without promising too much, I think it's going to be on product ops, which is a topic that has come up um, a lot over the last couple of years. And um, we're going to have two experts talk about that. Um, just getting the date lined in, and there'll be a, um, uh, an announcement over the, over the coming days. So stay tuned. And then later this year, we are going to talk about recruiting we're going to talk about uh data we're going to talk about a lot of other things so if you haven't um joined the meetup group stay up to date um and uh and oh there's one big announcement which i guess i should have made uh product tank great news has been acquired uh has been acquired by pendo um which is uh pendo.io check it out um uh so uh, it's a it's a tool for product people um i um i will probably do a larger piece on it in the next event and um that's it from us uh, everyone have a great evening see you at the next one and um stay safe <laughs>